Yeah, and it was kind of like what's up. So I think it's called uh, "How to Start a Record Label in Seven Steps with Zero Experience." You know, it's like a nice. little bit clickbaity, but you know, it sort of does what it does on the tin. So that's where it came from, and I kind of thought, I'll just what are the, you know, and that, and that came from like seven steps, meaning you could start theoretically start a record label in a week, you know, Monday to Sunday. And then on the following Monday, you'd be set up and then you'd be able to do the next stage, which is then releasing a record. Hey, uh, let's just be how you doing, Nick? How you doing? Welcome to the stream. Welcome to my disco shed. Yes, thanks, you, Graham. I've uh, I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, yeah, it's my first Twitch stream as well, which is pretty exciting. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's going to go super well. We've got loads to talk about, and uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's your first Twitch stream, amazing. Yeah, so you're breaking me in. Ah, uh, no. We can leave all the innuendo out. I'm not going to say I'm a Twitch virgin or anything on that, but... Uh, how, firstly, how are you? How's, how are you? How's your how's your last 18 months been? How's your pandemic been? How's my pandemic been? It's actually been not too bad. I had a baby in the pandemic, um, so that was pretty exciting. Um, and he is, yeah, he's amazing, gorgeous. Um, yeah, so that's been pretty cool. And yeah, and I, I guess I was quite lucky in some ways that uh, I pivoted in the music industry from, I did a lot of music management. So a lot of my income was from managing artists and I pivoted away from that um, when I started the label machine, which we can talk a little bit later on about, um, you know, because I wanted to serve rather than a few, I wanted to serve many. And I was quite lucky in that respect because when the pandemic came on, you know, all my mates that are music managers and artists, as you know, as we all know, it's been super tough not being able to go out and play live, you know, especially when that's a main income stream for you. Um, and on the flip, all these artists are now at home and they're like, right, well, what can I do with my time? I've, you know, I've always wanted to start a record label or, you know, I, I want to start focusing on these bits and pieces and, and level up. So I actually uh, had quite a good year um, in that respect from that kind of pivot so yeah I, and i'm just i'm just lucky pure luck like you know there's nothing nothing really more special in it that than that um but yeah i'm, I'm quite blessed that it went all right for me there are there's if, if you know i've got like other mates sort of in this space as well and and yeah we were we were kind of having those conversations but yeah it's like it, it, we're, we're quite lucky and also you know i think you can live in a in, in a westernized culture as well and living i mean i'm, I'm in london as well you can and if you've if you've done sort of okay and you've got a bit of savings, you're probably going to be all right. And you're sort of in a, live in a little bit of a bubble. It's like the sort of it's like the Brexit thing. Oh, there's no way we're going to be voting out of Brexit. That's ridiculous. But you're sort of in your little bubble and and you're not really aware of what's going on outside major cities sometimes. And I think there was a little bit of an element of that as well. But yeah, again, just trying to be like very lucky. And I know it hasn't been um, as fortunate for other people as well. Yeah, and uh, like I mean, the Ravens are now back, which is good. I'm, it's been it's starting to get moving again, which is nice. Yeah, I went to um, I went to ministry a couple of weeks ago, and it was like, what COVID? <laughs> there was I was I was in the I was in the I was in the back room, and uh, looking down at, at like at the dance floor, and it was sweat. There was like you just saw the drip sweating, the sweat drips condensation falling from the ceiling onto everybody below and I was like if there's one person in there with COVID everybody in this room is leaving with it tonight like it's crazy I mean you know everyone there is probably under the age of like 25 um, so they're probably it's just like a minor flu for them but yeah I guess herd, I guess herd immunity is working yeah I mean yeah that, that worries me so much like it worries me. I've had it already and it worries me like that yeah well I'll, yeah, I've got my second I've, just... I've got my second jab tomorrow so yeah i can't so that should that should help for sure yeah i think you got your i think you got covered just after i did or or, or about the same time because i think we're like we're sort of talking about trying to link up on here and yeah. i've i've been double jabbed and yeah i've still got it um but you know when i got covered i tested positive really you know it was like i had the flu for two or three days and that was about it 
like I just had it was like having the flu except ex- I mean sorry except I did once my symptoms went away I did get that like I couldn't taste anything which was mm. really weird it's um, weird isn't it <laughs> it's so weird because you think you can but then you're like is it just the sensation of the biscuit in my mouth or am I actually tasting this biscuit um, but what I did was my uh, we had a whole lot of Huel. I don't know if you know what Huel is. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. a it's like a, ma- a meal replacement type thing. And when my wife was like, she got quite bad morning sickness and she couldn't eat. We were like, we need to get some nutrients into you. So we ordered a whole lot of Huel. Um, and so she had that. But you know, after a couple of weeks, she was all, she was all right. So we've got all this Huel left over. And I was mm-hmm. like well, I'll just live on Huel for the next week while I can't taste anything because there's not really any point in wasting like yummy food if I can't taste it. <laughs> so yeah, I just I just ate Huel for a week and that was all right. Like not very satisfying, I, I, but... I, I ate lots of crunchy stuff and spicy <laughs> stuff because I, I figured I figured at least let's have let's have some sensations that's just that even if you can't taste them let's have crunch and 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 you'd get like heat but you couldn't feel you couldn't taste the heat you just got you just got heat in the back of your mouth which was which was fun yeah i think i did i think i did try cereal a couple of times and thought that was like if i wasn't thinking about eating i felt like i was tasting something <laughs> um okay so let's i figured let's kind of start at the start let's talk about you and let's talk about the and, and the history of the label machine and I'd kind of let you go for it and go for episode number one of your of you, basically. It all started, I was having a conversation with uh, Chris from the Prototypes uh, DMB Act, and he was saying to me, Nick, you're like, you're really good at focusing on other people and, and, and you know, making them a huge success and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, but have you ever thought about kind of turning that on yourself and... I thought, oh, you know, what could I do that would just be kind of my own kind of thing? And I thought, well, I've done a lot of label management and, you know, I've got some experience. At the time, I was was also sort of doing, um, I was moving into the film industry as well. So I do um, film production. Um, I've got a joint venture with a company called Goldfinch called First Flights. And uh, we work with first time directors and we make a lot of short films as well. So I, I was, I sort of thought you know what's something i can kind of wrap up all my music experience in and and the idea and i thought well you know what i'll write a book um about everything and that's kind of how the label machine started and i um i just spent nine months um i i got up every morning uh went through my morning routine i'd sit down in front of the computer with a cup of coffee and i'd just write for 20 minutes which worked out at about 500 words and then I'd just mm. stop. If I was on a bit of a vibe, you know, I wouldn't like stop and get up. If I was on a bit of a vibe, I'd keep going. But if I wasn't on a vibe, I'd just keep just going and brain dumping and just making sure my fingers are moving on the keys. Uh, and then nine months later, I had the first draft and I was like, amazing. And and interesting, I thought at that point, I'm like, well, I'm 80% of the way there. Like I've, I've done most of the work now. How wrong I was. <laughs> I was like... It's the equivalent of like knocking up like a 32 bar loop, putting an intro and outro on and going, well, it's pretty much the track's done, but you know, like (laughs) everything else to go through, especially if you're going to put it on vinyl and get it mastered on vinyl and released physically, like, you know, the journey from that to that is probably similar to where I was to actually having a, um, actually getting my book published and and, uh, a hard copy. Yeah. See, I I like showing how chunky it is because it turned out a lot fatter than I thought love that so so i so i I did that and and you know there was it was sort of also born a little bit out of a lot of the artists i'd worked with had i I went in one particular uh, guy a friend i set up his label and i basically he just brought me down for two days and i just set up i gave him all the instructions for how to set everything up and that kind of became the basis for it he was like that'd be amazing if this was like you know you could just access this at any time there's nothing like this online and i and the other thing i thought is you know a, a lot of like DIY books or how-to books that and especially around businesses like um you know there's famous ones like the four hour working week and things like that like when they tell you what to do when it gets to the practical bit I always thought it was really awkward to like uh, uh, like you know go to this website and then you know like and then into your details and all this kind of stuff and I thought you know everything you do nowadays is online it's like a it's a it's a pain to have those practical steps like it'd be great if all the practical elements once I've sort of done the theory was online somewhere And so that's kind of where the label machine platform came about. I was like, I'll take all the practical steps 
and I'll put that online so someone can just work through it and, and you know, like, you know, download the email templates, what you need to do and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how the website got born. And then that, you know, that kind of kept growing and becoming its own thing. And, and I was like, if, you know, how do you get, how do you, if you want to get your book published, how do you do it? And it's, it's, you know, it's the same as music, Bill, you know, you've got to have a fan base and then you release your music and, you know, and if you've got a fan base, it will do well. If you don't, well, it's going to go out to crickets. So I, that was sort of the other reason why I thought I'd build a platform is it's a way that I can start, you know, getting email addresses and building up a, you know, an audience of people that are going to be interested in, you know, starting and running independent record labels. The platform sort of became its own beast and it's, you know, it's now its own kind of like company and thing, which is, which is awesome. Um, COVID came along, um, but just before COVID, I was at home and I was like, well, how, how do I get my book published? So I just typed into Google how, <laughs> no, 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 sorry. I thought, I thought, where, where do publishers, I, I need to contact publishers, right? Where, you know, what's the classic thing? Like, where is your audience? Find where your audience hangs out and hang out with them and all that kind of, you know, classic marketing research stuff. So I was like, typed into Google, where do book publishers hang out and just push enter. <laughs> And, and it didn't give me like the, the exact answer. Like they're right here, Nick, just catching it, get in a taxi. But sort of through that, I dis <laughs> I, I discovered this, um, I discovered an Eventbrite website where Adobe were doing a, um, a, a like a, a meet and greet. Um, what do they call it? Like a, um, like a networking night for book publishers. And they basically get people to speak about, you know, uh, uh, the book industry publishing and then they have one of their guys kind of as one of the speakers you know hyping all their adobe stuff and yes yeah, free free drinks and all that kind of stuff so i thought oh i'll just i'll 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 go to that as a and and i'll blag my way in and because i'm called the label machine i think they just thought oh he must have something to do with making book labels or something so i kind of got yeah. in there nice. and uh and I, I turned up and i rem and i remember it was like a really rainy night and there was actually a film premiere I was supposed to be at. And I was like, ah, and I was like, don't give this, this is the right path, Nick. Go down here. I'm sure something all good will come out of it. And I'm so glad I did. Um, so I went down and, and you know, the woman and, and uh, said, hey, how are you? And, and I said, oh, I'm Nick from The Label Machine. And then I said, look, uh, I've got to be honest. You know, I'm not actually a publisher. I'm a writer, but I'm looking for a publisher and, and sort of gave my little spiel. And she was like, oh, it's quite cheeky, but I admire that. So I'll introduce you to some people. So she started introducing me. So I was just networking around and I, I, went up, I went up to this really tall guy who looked very important. And I thought this guy looks like a Billy Big Balls. Um, so I started doing my uh, <laughs> elevator, my elevator pitch at him. And he was like, whoa, 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 whoa there, son. And then he just goes, Colin, yelled at this guy across the room. Colin comes over and he's like, Colin, you need to speak to this guy. Colin's a music publisher. And I was like, awesome. And so I turned around and, you know, started speaking to Colin. Uh, so he has Velocity Press. Um, you might also know Colin as the owner of and founder of uh, Knowledge Magazine. Yes. I know Colin. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, th I figured you, you would have crossed paths with him at, at some point. So he's now, yeah, he's he's now a book publisher. Um, so, that's, yeah. That's, I, really, I, that's really handy to know. That's really for, for, for future. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link you in, bro. When you write your when you write your book, <laughs> it's I, I, uh, it's on the pl it's it's one of those things again. It's on the plan, but again, like I I need to build the, I'm building the audience first, like you said. So, so um yeah, you know, and he was like, hey, sounds good, and we had a meeting, and then he you know offered me a, a publishing deal, and you know, and then yeah, we got the kind of, and then here we are, like well, so that was just post COVID, and then we sort of delayed it a little bit because I wanted to be able to go out and talk about the book. And, you know, um, and go to, you know, music festivals and, and whatnot and go to ADE and stuff. So we sort of delayed it a little bit. Yeah, and just went through the process of putting it together, which, which like I said, is like, it's just so much like, I think doing an ebook is different because I guess it's like a digital version, you know, you just sort of upload and it's done. But when it's physical, you know, there's all the typesetting, you've got to get an editor, you've got to get a typesetter, you've got to get like all the stuff's got to be designed perfectly and you know then you get a demo sent and is that all right and yeah it's it's quite involved i didn't realize how involved um but yeah it's it's all worth it at the end i uh, uh, something else as well that was really about about writing something like this that i found is that all those little stories and anecdotes and things that you sort of tell and you're like 
is that actually a real fact or is that just something someone told me and it sounds cool when I, you know, when I'm talking to somebody. Um, so I actually had to like do a lot of fact checking about stuff and about the history of the music industry and, and where stuff kind of works. Um, so there's a mm. kind of, yeah, that, that was a, because you're putting it in a book, right? So if yep. you've got it wrong, you've got like egg on your face forever. Um, yep. And no one, no one wants egg on their face. I want to talk to you more about writing books as well, but we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, because you ran labels before starting the label machine you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. How did I get to that? I guess pre that. Yeah. I mean, I originally, I was, I was always sort of into music and sounds like even as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. So like I inadvertently before DJing was even like a thing. Well, at least very much in my world. Um, I, I used to like, I, I had like a record player at home and then I had like this old Yamaha synthesizer and uh, they used to like, had like weird beat things that I play on it and stuff. And I, w and I was like, how do I get that sound and the sound that's on the record player to combine into another sound that I can put on the tape machine over there? And like, <laughs> and, I, and, and I went to this, and, in, and I, I think in New Zealand they had this, so New Zealand, if you haven't picked up, it's where my accent's from. That's where I'm from, New Zealand. I, I, yeah, um, yeah, my, my, my ex-wife's a, ex a Kiwi, uh, so we, therefore my daughters, are, my daughters are half a Kiwi as well. So uh, I, knew, I uh, knew already. Uh, you know the way. Where, where, so, where in, let's just do the, where in New Zealand are you from? Yeah. Let's just do that for, for, where, go for that. Uh, so I, was, I was born in Auckland mm -hmm. and then I did, I actually grew up in Papua New Guinea and my dad went over there for like uh, telecommunications engineer stuff. And then I did high school in the North Shore. I did university in Waikato. Uh, and then ah, I came back my, to... that's, that's, that's where my ex wife's from in the Waikato. Oh, really? Oh, nice. Yeah. I was in Hamilton. Yeah, I've been there. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, I've been to the, I've been, to, been to the Tron. Been to the Hamilton. The Tron Hamilton. The, the Hamilton. city of the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my, um, that was my uni stomping days. Um, so, so yeah, so, so, so going back to my story, I, Sorry. I was like, okay. how do I do this? And they had like the equivalent of Maplin in, in New Zealand is called Dick Smith. And yeah. I went down there and and went through and, and asked the guy and he's like, oh, you, you can build a thing called an audio mixer. And so I bought all the little like little components and a soldering iron and stuff and went <laughs> home and like built this thing and put it in like a, had to build like a wooden box to put it in. And then I could mix these two audio bits and they'd go into another audio bit, a little volume and an EQ. And then I could record this thing, and and I didn't realize, you know, that was like my, there was like I built a and a like an audio mixer for like, you know, obviously I wasn't kind of DJing, and and I kind of look at like not even thinking about it, and then looking back, I was like, wow, I never realized kind of how into like music and tech and music I was, even at like you know like thirteen years old. Um, so I got to uni, I was I was like a radio DJ there, and then I started a band. We got second in the Battle of the Bands finals. We were like a, a cross between Chemical Brothers and the Beastie Boys. Um, nice. So we basically like wrapped over kind of like block rocking beats. Nice. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. And then that kind of introduced me to the world of like club music and electronic music. Uh, and that's when I kind of started like, did like DJing and producing. Came to the UK. I mean, before I did though, I actually started a record label and it failed miserably. We did a music release and um, put the whole thing together. We're bringing DJs in from like um, around the country for a club night we were running called Kings and Electro. And uh, we put this compilation together. I was, I was running with a mate of my mat. Yeah, the day it's supposed to come out, went to the music stores, nothing in the music stores. We're like, what the hell's going on? Road, drove around to the distributor and they'd gone bankrupt like a week before. Oh, fuck's sake. I know. And all our, we just had a stack of, like, this is, you know, back in the days when you sold stuff on CDs. It was just a, all these boxes of CDs just sitting there, like, going nowhere. So that was like a bit of a kick in the teeth. And uh, so I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, and all my mates were like, you need to get to the UK, Nick. Like, it's where all the electronic music is. It's like fucking amazing. Just get your ass over here. So what years I came was over like 2005, 2000, yeah, 2005. So mm -hmm. about 15, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so I came over and I said, I'll give myself four year, five years to break it into the music industry. If I don't do it, I'll, I'll bugger off back home and, and, you know, keep building what I was kind of working on there. Um, so yeah, I just did like went out and just networked like crazy, like just went to club nights and, and like a lot of my mates weren't like my uni mates weren't really into 
kind of uh, electronic music and dance stuff. And so I, I did find I'd sometimes go to a lot of these nights by myself. And, you know, sometimes I'd be walking there and it's raining and cold in the winter. And I'm like, oh, like what am I doing? And I was, I was like, no, you're here to, you know, just keep fucking going. You know, you'll get your break eventually. And and I, I, I was quite into um, break beats at the time. So I was kind of like following the kind of plump DJs, you know, the finger licking crowd. I was kind of like went to a lot of their parties. Um, yeah, that, that, all that kind of crew. And um, and yeah, so through there, I sort of would stick around at after parties and, and you know, eventually I kind of, I became uh, friends with a guy called Tommy Dash who was releasing under Control Z. And um, yeah, he wanted to get away. He was just releasing on a on a label called Hardcore Beats and he was wanted to go away and kind of do his own thing. And he was like, do you want to start a label? And that was the kind of the next, that was Never Say Die. And that was the kind of the next big music project I did. I was, I was sort of, before then I was trying to, uh, I was setting up a company for doing music licensing because I'd had a, a few of my tracks licensed for computer games. Um, nice. And I thought, oh, this is kind of like, this is an interesting world that I didn't know about. And I was sort of like, I'd set that up. And yeah, I think I think at the time Tommy thought, oh, well, this guy's quite good at like setting stuff up. Like we well, set a label up. So yeah, and then we just, we, we, we had a, we did a dubstep remix by datsik and excision on the first release and it and we were so like and this was like early early bro step and Mm -hmm. it went off and then on the second release so we'd do singles with like a bunch of remixes that was like our kind of that was our model and we did vinyl as well so we'd do vinyl releases sick artwork and you know put it out like you know just went hard out on it and it would just at right time right place that was just when it was like just taking off in the US and we just kind of rode that wave and it just kept getting nice. bigger and we signed signed like a, an early Skrillex track and that was like sure. huge for us and and yeah we just kind of we got in on that boat at the beginning and just kind of rode that wave so you know and off the back of that I started um, Disciple with um, Dodger and Fusky as well um, I set up Get Hype with the prototypes I set up No Tomorrow which is like the electro uh, like house kind of um, offshoot of uh, Never Say Die and yeah, just, you know, through all of that, I, I kind of got to experience all aspects of the music industry. Like, I mean, we did everything. We set up like, we did our own merch and house, you know, which uh, some things worked and some things didn't. Um, but, you know, I learned a lot. We sort of, you know, we dipped our toe in like setting up publishing. We set up management companies as well, um, which is always a really natural progression when you're setting up a label. I'd always say, once your label's established, once you get to about the 30th or 40th release, definitely start looking at management, especially for your kind of younger guys that need some guidance. Yeah, so that was kind of like, um, that's kind of like how I got all my experience um, to then, yeah, build the label that's machine. That's mad. That's mad. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I went to New Zealand around 2005. Like I went there then and i think i went to record stoppers and i was like got any house music and they were like there's a lot of drum and bass and breaks and 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 yep. hip-hop and I, and then i was like okay where's the house music like i was trying to buy records yeah and- so house music in new zealand was run by tim finn um yeah and, i know that guy yeah he's and he's you know it was all kind of pop house what you not you don't really get the underground stuff in new zealand greg churchill he's he's a pioneer of like the the proper underground stuff and angela fiskin um but yeah it's um a lot of drum and bass drum and bass is massive you know the upbeats have mm. moved out. alex perez has just moved out there uh, upbeats right. have gone home yeah it's we, we do like our kind of breaky stuff out there but but there is a there is a little bit of house not much techno i think that's the biggest lacking electronic um genre out there um yeah side trance, to, went, that's the other big one i went to i went to i went uh crafty cuts was touring out there and i ra- i went to a load of I know him, and I went. We were. I was out there at the same time. I was. Like, oh, you're here! Fuck! Let's go. And I'll meet you. And we sort of drove around the country with him for a little couple of days. It was quite fun. Oh, nice. I um. I I had a. Uh, the cool thing about New Zealand is because it's so tiny. When big acts come over, you can really interact with the crowd. Or you can really interact with them. Like there's not really <coughs> like VIP yeah. areas or anything. And um, Diplo before he was before he was just on the cusp of blowing up. He was out there and he was playing um, at a warehouse night and I went along and I ended up and it was getting very messy at the end and I ended up getting on stage and emceeing for Diplo for the crowd, like very pissed <laughs> and very high. And I, I didn't really think, uh, you know, it's just like, it's kind of, you know, DJ over here, we're all kind of having fun. And then, you know, year, years later, you know, the Diplo, what he's kind of grown into. And I was like, wow, that was pretty bizarre. I, I, I kind of ended up having that experience, not kind of 
knowing what he would turn into. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and then I was going to say, the ne- then obviously then you started the label machine. Uh, and then I want to talk about, I know I've watched, I was watching on your website earlier, uh, your seven steps to starting a label, which was, was so interesting. Guys, you want to watch it, go and watch it. It's literally on the front. It's, a, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I yeah, thought I'd sort of chat through some of those and just kind of get your, let's, obviously you can go and watch the full thing there. Let's, I thought we'd go a little bit more brief and just, so I mean the the the, the seven steps that a label. I mean that's kind of like you know my, my main audience, I guess at the moment, um, is if you want to start a label, right? There's no, yep. you know, there's no real kind of guide out there. So I was like, you know, that kind of came out of like you know wanting to do a masterclass, which is what I say instead of saying webinar. It's a webinar, but I hate the word webinar because it sounds so freaking marketing. But yeah, the, the the sort of the seven steps came out of like you know I was like I want to do you know, webinar, because it's a really great way of, um, you know, providing value to someone, um, you know, that isn't aware of you. um, And then, you know, kind of come uh, introduce them to your world and, and, you know, kind of maybe get involved and, you know, sign up and whatnot. Yeah, and it was kind of like, what's up? So I think it's called uh, How to Start a Record Label in Seven Steps with Zero Experience. You know, it's like a a little bit clickbaity, but, you know, it sort of does what it does on the tin. So that's where it came from. And I kind of thought, I'll just, what are the, you know, and and that came from like, seven steps meaning you could start theoretically start a record label in a week you know monday to sunday and then on the following monday you'd be set up and then you'd be able to do the next stage which is then releasing a record so there's there's sort of like three main areas what you you want to set up your you want to set up your record label kind of all the the admin the branding the marketing side once that's established the next part is you do your first music release and then so there's all the you know the practicalities of going through that and you know mm-hmm. getting your, your music mastered artwork sorted uploading to distributor preparing your press releases and all that kind of stuff so you've got that and then the third part is the marketing and then distributing that music and trying to get as many listeners to listen to it and then those listeners to become fans and then you know the classic marketing funnel then to become super mm-hmm. fans and, and and whatnot so those are the three like the bigger picture stuff, those are the kind of main three areas, um, which you sort of, you know, if you're running a music business, you focus on. So the the first bit is the foundations, which is those seven steps. And yeah, so I think, yeah, step one um, is right in your business plan. Um, now this is like, it's one of those things that everybody hates to do because, and I think the reason why nobody likes writing a business plan is because you actually have to make some like important decisions about what you're actually going to do because it's really easy right to go i'm starting a record label oh awesome bro that's so cool yeah i'm gonna put my stuff out i'm gonna sign um blah 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 and it's gonna be like amazing actually like going okay what does that what does that actually mean like what are you like what's your vision like who are you signing like you know where are you gonna you know where are you gonna distribute your music through what kind of like branding is really important so what kind of how are you gonna brand like how are you gonna are you gonna do your artwork are you gonna get like an an amazing artist who's gonna do all like super original stuff are you gonna use a template um how much money uh, have you got to invest in this you know like how many releases are you gonna do which means you know if you've got two grand to invest and you want to do six releases a year well you know you divide that by two and you're like well hang on that means i've only got you know three just over three hundred dollars per release you know is that enough for a release so it's all that kind of stuff which is super important and it really separates out like the one thing i've seen is the people that do spend some time thinking about those kind of questions answering them making a decision and then writing it down just they their labels they do just start labels and become a success like it, it's just it, it it does seem to go very much hand in hand and it's not to say some people wing it run it by the seat of their pants and you know and and they maybe get on trend or something and it just blows up and it, and that's completely cool but um you know those are the outliers if you if you kind of want to have a more um if you want more control over your kind of like destiny i guess um it is pretty essential um so yeah, at, I, at, I mean, actually, actually, actually working out the business of of a music business. Wow, that's that's yeah. That I, I'm da- like I I don't do it at all. I'm terrible. I just go. Well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put a record out and go. But the, the, some of those things you just said then, I should actually think about so much, so much like budgets. I never, I never think about budgets. So I just kind of go. Let's mm. do it. Uh, yeah, and 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 you can and, and like and I, and I and should. It, you fuck. I should do that. You know. It just it just and the thing is 
as you grow, it'll make things a lot easier to scale mm. because, you know, you've got stuff in place. Um, and it also means like, you know, you might be, you know, you releases might come out and they might do all right. You know, if you had a plan and it was more organized and you know what you're doing, they could do really well. Um, mm. You know, so that, that's, you know, it's a really important step. Um, and I know it is difficult to do. I mean, I, that's why there's like a, on the blog, you can download a template that's kind of got it all done with examples. So you can just kind of like, yeah, download the template and then just enter in your own info. And I'm actually working on a little project which is going to like automate it where you'll just answer a whole series of questions and then you'll hit a button and it will just spit out your business plan for you. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I I mean, every time I do a project, I kind of think, what's the plan? And, you know, it, it's, it's always a it's always a kind of struggle to do that. Would you redo the plan? Like, do you can, can do, you, do you redo the business plan every X, nine, you know, so many times, you know, and maybe a year or yeah. every two years or every three years? Would, is that something that happens again and again and again and again, again? It's not just one standard. Yeah, yeah. So definitely you revisit every 12 months. Like I do, I revisit my business plan um, every January. But, you know, you, you sometimes as well, every month I do an analytics update and I look at everything and, and you know, see where we're going and, and planning. So if you're doing that, sometimes your business plan's evolving every month and, and you know, so you can do it that way. An another another massive, massive reason to start, or a couple of big reasons as well to start, uh, to, sorry, write a business plan. So the first one is if you want any kind of investment, you're going to have to have a business plan, 100% because before anyone invests in you, they want to know that you know what you're talking about and you've, you know, like who's the team involved, what budgets you got and all that kind of stuff. You know, they need to see that you're organized. Secondly, if you want to, and this is um, particularly important for um, electronic music producers, and I, I guess I guess all I guess all artists studying labels, is if you want to go for one of the managed distributors, so, so just I'll quickly t touch on distribution. You've got your, your TuneCore, CD Baby, DistroKid, where basically anybody can just upload music, so long as it's a WAV file and a piece of artwork and you pay your money, you'll get it on Spotify, right? But if you wanna work with a distributor that is, you know, got account managers, they've got links, you know, with um, uh, Spotify playlist pluggers, they've got usually got like extra services and tools like accounting tools, um, DJ mail up tools and all that kind of stuff. You, you, you have to apply to become a, a label that's distributed with them. And a big part of that is you're gonna to have to have a business plan to show that you know what you're doing. Um, you know, I, I think I know label works, they get something like, I think it's like five or 600 applicants a week. It's something ridiculous like that. So if you're looking at that, right, and you're looking, what are the, first of all, how are you gonna cull? Have they, got, have they got a, you know, I think you have to upload a business plan anyway, but like, you know, if you don't have that business plan, you're not even getting your foot in the door. So yeah, it's, it's another, it's another, if you're really starting out um, and you, you don't have, you know, you've got limited links in the industry, you know, a business plan is 100% essential. I always, I always, when they're doing business plans, it's always the projections part. It's just like, like, how do you project how much you're gonna make? It's like. That's a good question. And that's why there's a template inside the business plan that you can copy. <laughs> you do essentially like, you do sort of pull numbers out of your ass a little bit. <laughs> the best way to do it is is to base it on your, you know, how, what are your expenses? And then you'd say, well, I want to, you know, within 18 months of starting the label, I want it to start be break. I want it to start breaking even. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can kind of work backwards from there. You know, so after 18 months, if you've got 10 releases out and it's costing you, you know, $500 per release, then that's five grand. So, you know, within 18 months, you want to be making five grand. So that will be your, you know, and maybe add like 10% on for profit or something. So you'd go, cool, like my projections is five and a half grand for the next year and a half or, or round up like seven grand for the first 24 months or something. So that's, that's like a rough way you can kind of put it together. That's probably going to be fairly realistic. But you you do kind of have to guess until you start putting releases out and then you start seeing, okay, cool, when we put a release out, you know, we sell this much, we get this many streams, it earns about this much money for an artist of this level and then you can sort of do a bit more realistic projections. That's handy. Oh, well, that's, that was just step one. Shit, we got to we could go. Do you remember any <laughs> other steps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll go through. I'll try and, I'll try and do it a little bit uh, more quickly. <laughs> no, no, you've um, got time. You're good, you're good, you're good. We've this got good time. Way. I mean, goodness. <laughs> 
I normally break down like all the different parts of a business plan, so I'll I'll I won't I won't we won't go through that. We'll just go into. Yeah, the, can go uh, watch that on the link. <laughs> yeah, just watch the video. Go and you know make yourself a nice drink and sit down and and spend an hour watching me kind of go into detail. Yeah, so the uh, the next part is you want to set up your business filing system. So I, I guess the the way of thinking about this is what is an actual record label like a you know a digital record label if you don't have a storefront and you're not you know selling records like what what is and and that is the the kind of the backbone is the sort of 12 like folders that sort of are essentially the backbone to how you organize everything in your record label so you know you've got your you've got your account section your action plans your demos folder your design folder um your directory of you know your databases of um your PR, uh, your like your blog contacts and your spotify um, playlist contacts you want to pitch to um, you've got your distribution folder you've got your in it licensing folder for when you license your music um, you've got your releases folder and then under the releases folder you've got you know your record label 01 02 for the different releases and then inside those you've got artwork press wave masters i think that's normally up there so it's kind of main three a password when I, when folder I wa- for keeping all your passwords when i watched this i was like that was one of the most riveting parts of the whole thing. I was like, "Shit!" Because I'm quite into. I'm into folders. I have folders for everything, and so I have folders of everything. And I was just like, "Oh, this!" Like I was like, "Oh, there's some I haven't got." Oh, I, sh- I need to. I need to. St- I'm, I'm using these bad boys. Like I was like, "He's got folders I don't have." Like it was like a little bit of folder envy. It was like, "Fuck!" I need to. I need to. I, I need to get my folder game folder better, form. man. I'm, I'm, I'm watching this again later. I need to sort this out. Bum this bad boy out. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think you can download it from the. Yeah, you can just download it on the on the blog. It's, it's all it's all for free, bro. You can just go download it. Um, but yeah, that's you know, if, if you are starting another label, it's a good place to kind of start with, you know. And I, I think another really important thing about going through this process as well is it will like like I said before about being able to kind of grow and 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 expand and scale is that when you sort of set everything up like this, it's a lot easier to hand it over to somebody else to start running it for you. You know, ha- having, you know, like an organized file structure and, and that's kind of a, a standard template is gonna be a lot easier, yeah, when you, when you sort of hand it over to someone. So step three, decide your record label name. And most, it tends to be the one thing that people kind of, you normally the first thing people kind of create. Um, but, you know, I, I, if you don't have a record label name, you sort of, you don't, everything starts you can't actually go anywhere unless you've got a record label name because without that, you can't get your website domain. If you're setting up a limited liability company, I mean, you could set it up under a random name, but if you want to put under your label name, you're not going to be able to do that. You also, you know, when you're deciding a name, you need to go and check whether or not that name is taken. So you might already have a name and you're like, hey, I really like, you know, this, the, you know, the sound of, you know, Insanity Records. You need to go to Discogs and type it in and check. You know, is there already an Insanity Records? Which you know there is, and you'd think, okay, mm-hmm. like what am I going? What am I going to do about that? And and you know, there's a, there's a few things you can do. You can, uh, I mean, if the record label is old and did a different type of music. So if it's like some old seventy, if Insanity Music was like some old seventies Latin funk label that pretty much only put music out in Italy or something like that, and they, don't, they haven't put any music out in ten years you're probably going to be all right. Like, and if they were called Insanity Records, you could change it to Insanity Recordings or Insanity Music or Insanity Entertainment or something like that. You're, you're normally going to be okay. Um, if they're still pretty recent, yeah, you're just going to have to come up with another name. And Is there any and, no-nos with names? Is there any kind of like definite, you should definitely not use those sort of things? I mean, anything, I guess I'd say anything profanity, but it depends on what kind of what genre. I mean, you know, B- Balearic Underground Music might sound cool, but then you're like, what's the acronym? bum might be all right (laughs) or you know like any you just got to be careful of your acronyms i guess um i don't think there's any like major no-nos i think so long as it sounds so long as it's as long as you can say it easily because you'll be saying a lot lot, um that's going to be pretty important um it's it's when you say it someone can spell it easily as well so if if someone's looking up because you you tend to be your your social media handles which is what most people are going to search you for and, and when you're finding stuff you know, you don't want to have some weird name that, you know, they're never going to be able to find you. Um, mm. So those are kind of, the, the, those would be two two things to kind of watch out for. Um, but you can actually, so you can go to a cool website called um, Namecheck, which is dot com, And you can type in there a handle name. So, you know, using Insanity Records again. So let's say we type in like Insanity Rick, 
um, it will actually check whether or not like the dot com dot org dot co dot uk, um, the Twitter, Instagram, like I, I think it's like about eighty six different nice. handles, Twitch, whether or not they're nice. taken or not instantly, and it just comes up with like a little green and red light. So you can just sit there and you can keep typing in one until you find it's like green on most of them and you can go great. So you know you can go and when, when you go and claim those profiles, you know, you'd be able to, you know, let's say it's like we are insanity wreck is green on all of them. You're like, cool, we are insanity wreck.com. And then, you know, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Twitch, your um, TikTok, whatever is just all that same at we are insanity wreck. And it's just so much simpler for branding. This is all useful for, you know, just not for labels. If you've got a new artist or you're, you know, you're, you're launching a new artist act or brand or something like that, like all this stuff is really important as well. Like, because it, it applies for record labels or artists, you know, you can't have the same artist name. Um, and if you want to have like a, you know, a, a unique artist handle, you know, both of these, the Discogs and the name check are really handy tools to go through and do that. Yeah. So once, once those are done, you know, once you've found your name, you, you want to go and register, you know, your, your register your website. And, and kind of lock it in because I think that having a having a website is a kind of like that first step of making your label uh, like uh, official you know and, and you, you can go on GoDaddy now at the moment it's like 99 cents for the first year so you know there's no real excuse and you know and you can set up at, like their website builder as well is pretty cool now you know you can you can set up a, a very basic website and then just links to your social handles which you've signed up because you know they're available because you check them on name checker and you can very quickly <laughs> kind of set everything up yeah for under a tenner so still important websites you think well it's funny you should ask me that graham because step four is what kind of website you need to have and what kind of social media platforms you need to be on um I, that wasn't that wasn't even prime so <laughs> fuck's sake, <that's> cool. <laughs> like websites yeah a website is really i mean it can be as big as small as you want um but if you're going to be any kind of professional outfit you know whether or not it's you know even a record label or music you know having a website is pretty key it's you know it's usually what when people google and want to find out more about you it's going to be one of the first places and and you know even if you've just got like a you know your insanity rex we are insanity rex.com to keep using that example you know even if it's just like yeah we are insanity rex you know we're a you know we're a tech house uh, record label um for we might you know we mostly hang out on um instagram you know you've got the instagram link and then you've got your facebook your twitch and all that yeah you know, it's just nice and easy and when that links off and it works well and if you do a little bit of seo when people google you it's going to go come to the top of the page people can quickly find you quickly see where you're hanging out so yeah i i and and once you've claimed it as well you know if, if your label does take off and, be, and become a huge success you know you don't want to have to go back and then try and get a website that's you know suddenly been taken or it's not going to kind of match up you might as well have it in there and you know it then becomes the basis for you know you want to you want to start selling merch boom you know you've got your website done so you can have it on there it's also due to the new ios 14 changes with facebook if you're doing any facebook advertising now you need to have your company verified via a website so if you don't have a website you can't actually do proper Facebook and Instagram advertising, which is super important for growing your fan base. So actually, like to answer your original question, nowadays it is essential. Like six months ago, you know, mm. but it, you know, if you're serious and you're gonna be putting, you know, you wanna promote your music in any way, you're gonna have to have a website, even if it's just for the Facebook verification process. Yeah, so you need it. Um, yeah, yeah, and it, I forgot. I, yeah, I forgot about the. Yeah, that's cool. The I, yeah, of course, because the IRC. You, you need. Yeah, you need the domain, don't you, for that as well? Yes, yeah. That's so true. I mean, you know, it's it's not hard. You don't have to have. They don't check. You know, whether it's not some super fancy website. You just got to have the domain there that you copy your pixel code underneath. Well, it's not the pixel code. I can't remember what they call it. But yeah, you you kind of kind of have that set up. And you know what? It's you know, there's there's Squarespace, there's Wix, there's Weebly, like. Um, there's the and like I said, GoDaddy has got like its own inbuilt website, which is pretty like it's pretty functional and pretty cool um, that you can use. There's not really any excuse not to get a you know a, a basic website set up. I, I mean, I, I prefer using WordPress um, just because of the flexibility and it's not too expensive. I know Danny Savage is a big pusher on 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 WordPress as well. We often like joke about that because I'll push something else. But yeah, I um, even even Mailchimp. You can actually you can actually build websites in Mailchimp now as well, which is quite handy. Really? Weird. I mean, 
I guess, um, you know, if you're having a landing page for, you know, to, to have an email to download something, I know MailChimp were doing that for a while, so I guess it's maybe an extension of that. But yeah, like, exactly. There's no there's no excuse. Sign up to MailChimp, get your website set up. Um, the next part, of obviously, with that is um, getting all your social media handles sorted out, you know, and that's just go and sign up, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, Snapchat, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Twitch, TikTok. And, you know, even even like, even if you think you're not going to use it, just claim it, like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and save the password and the email address in your passwords folder. Like, like I said, you don't want to go back later if things are going, you know, blowing up and you're like, ah, oh, you, you kind of can't get the actual handle that you want. I do that whenever social media, so like new social media pops out, I go and grab the my at Graham Farmer and at Data Transmission as quick as possible and just kind of sit in there and not really do anything but watch other people. You can always you can always guarantee you can search defected in there in there as well straight away. Like, yeah, yeah, really smart, really smart move. Have you got a clubhouse? I have got a clubhouse. I've not. I've been on there once. It kind of it kind of popped in January, March, January, January, February, March in the UK, and I, mm. I was kind of busy. Right, I was busy homeschooling and writing my course, and just I was just like, I haven't got time for that shit. Uh, I think I popped in there once, and I think I've got. I think I've got some followers on there. I don't know. Yeah, I I, I just asked because I, I was just reading an article with how yeah, clubhouse has just gone like <sighs> kind of off. And I was, I was going to invest, I was like, hey, this looks really cool. And I was going to invest a lot of time kind of into it. And I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is, is that story. So yeah, you, you, uh, you, you didn't miss anything. I think I popped in there twice and I literally popped in there to listen to listen to someone and someone was like, come up on the stage. And I was like, I don't want to come up on the stage. I just want to just want to sit and just listen to something while I was working. Like, I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> okay, so step five. It's the first kind of bit you do on branding, which is get a logo, kind of like pretty essential and basic part you need for your label. Yeah, I mean, like these days, so so you can go and hire a designer and and pay like a grand or something. Personally, I don't think you sort of, you need to do that these days. A a good option is going on and um, hiring off a freelance website, Fiverr, freelancer.com, Design Crowd, 99designs, all those kind of places. Pay less than $100 and you can get something pretty good. Um, what I did find, though, which is what led me on to the third way of getting a logo, on one of these sites, you can you can say, I'm looking for this logo, and people will create one, and then you can kind of pick which one you like. So I think that's how 99designs works. And what I realized is you can actually use a design, an online logo maker. So there's one called looker.com, and there's freelogodesigner.com as well. And they're really, really good. You, you just type in what your... You type in what your... Um, your area is so you know you type in music or record label it then presents you with a whole lot of like example logos and you just kind of pick the ones you like the look of and then you hit a button it just auto generates logos with your like your name in it and different kind of fonts and those styles that you liked and then you just you keep you just keep scrolling down and you just keep going refresh and it just generates new ones and new ones and then you can just find one you like and then it opens up in an editor and then you can like tweak it and change the color and the sizes and you know, you can you can get something pretty passable is probably the right word to use. Like, you know, it, it's not rubbish. You know, it's it's occasionally it might like look amazing, and, it, and it, I guess it does come down to your eye for design and stuff. But I always say like start there. And the other good thing about that is then you can go to a you know you could go to a proper designer and say, hey, look, this is you know I've, I've got this. Can you make it better? Like, can you style it a bit better and stuff like that? So yeah, that's a that's a kind of first part of branding. Get your logo done and. Yeah, I always say, yeah, just knock one up and um, logo maker. And you can do lots of very, you can do lots of designs as well, and then you know send them out to friends and family and say, hey, which ones do you guys like the most as well? Um, that's always a good idea. So, or I also, maybe, or even like run them on social media and get people to vote because then you can kind of then you're kind of putting it out there that you're starting a label. Like if you did it on your personal Facebook and you were like, I've got I've got three logos, but you kind of haven't announced you've got a web, you're starting a label. Which one's your favorite? And then that kind of does it for you a little bit, don't you? exactly it's, yeah that's such a good idea yeah definitely and, it, and you know if you're an artist as well and you've really got a bit of a following yeah it's, i think that's a perfect way to announce that a label is going to be coming down the line yeah and and then you know as well they're like oh wow kind of already engaging with what you're going to be doing and they're kind of part of that process you're already going to kind of have those super fans coming in at the beginning 
Uh, cool. So you got uh, we've got ins- we've got Insanity Records, the logo now set up. That's totally awesome. The next part is registering your label as a business. There's three main reasons why you want to register yourself as a business. One is protection. Basically, if you have a limited liability company, or if you're in America an LLC, and you if you're on the way to the studio um, or you're at a gig, um, and you knock someone over and, and injure them. Um, or you, you injure a fan or something like that, the company is liable, not you personally, which means, you know, if they decide to sue you, you know, they can only take the assets of the company. They can't take, you know, your own personal assets and you've got to kind of sell your house and stuff. So that's quite a, like a kind of key way um, you have to protect yourself. The second reason is legitimacy. You know, when you see, I mean, you, you know, when you're going out and about in life and people email you and stuff like that, you know, if you see someone who's, you know, got a bona fide like LLC or limited liability company, you know, because there are some, you know, there are some hoops to jump through. People know that, okay, this is something that's serious and credible. Um, You know, you you can have your, uh, again, like, you know, having your own website, you want to have your name at, you know, your record label name.com. It's, you know, you're, you're going to be treated like a professional, more doors are going to open, you know, rather than having like, you know, Nick Sadler 69 at gmail.com and I'm trying to kind of <laughs> trying to like you know make you know have some sort of reaching out to start a professional relationship with someone you're just not really going to be taken as seriously so that's a that's another really important reason and motivation as well like I said you've got to jump through some hoops and um, you know and there and there is you know there is some uh, you've got to set up uh, there's some money to kind of um, set up like some business admin costs and stuff like that and you know, by setting that up, you're sort of going to at least motivate yourself to at least make enough money to kind of like cover those costs as well. Yeah, you've got you've got more skin in the game, I guess, as well. Like you're you're more you're, it's just like that little bit more invested. Yeah, exa- exactly. Yeah, I think that's a, good, a really good point. You just got more skin in the game, and you know, these it's not too hard these days. There's like LegalZoom.com, one two three Registration.co.uk. Like you know, I, go and use one of these platforms. You know that they're. they're you can do it via, you know, your own government website. It's a little bit more complicated. You just may as well just, you know, use one of these websites. It kind of sets it all up for you. And and if you want to get a business bank account as well, um, and you want to apply for like business loans, you're going to have to do this anyway. You know, uh, the flip is if you've already got, uh, I mean, if you're already an artist that's set up as a, as a, you know, as a company as well, you could set up a sub um, business account underneath that to keep kind of all your label accounting separate because that, that's another key thing when royalties and start coming through like you, you can't have it being mixed up with your personal finances it would just become extremely messy and very disorganized very quickly so you know that that's a another kind of key reason for having it set up properly and um the, the only the only reason why you might not do that is if you were setting up a, a self you know your own vanity label just to self-release your own music you're not going to sign anybody else um you're already set up as like a sole proprietor as an artist that will be the only time I'd say we probably don't need to do it if you're not too worried about the protection type thing, you know, then because all the, you know, it's only your own music. It's only going through your own accounts. Um, and if you kind of wanted to save the, you know, the overheads of, of setting up a um, business, that will be the only time I'd say, you know, I can understand why you wouldn't do it. Otherwise, you know, definitely set yourself up. Are you enjoying this interview? If you are, consider subscribing to us on YouTube. And if you want to watch them live, come and join us on Twitch. The link's below, twitch.tv forward slash Graham Farmer. We have live interviews, A&R sessions, demo listening sessions. We get labels into uh, signing records. Come and join us on Twitch. It's good fun. Let's jump back into the interview, though. Let's go. Whilst we're on that, more and more, more and more artists are setting up their own labels, or they're they're considering self-releasing. Is there benefits to setting up their own label, or is it, or should they? Like, what's the benefits of each, basically? Because I know, I know, I know, I know some people. I know some people in the chat have like. There's some people in our chat that are sat on like 20, 30 records and they're like, should I go and send them out to labels or should I set my own, you know, should I go and set, should, just release them myself or should I self-release them? Like, where are we going? That's a great question. And like, so my philosophy is, if you want to be a success in the music industry, you've got to think like a record label because the record label model takes care of all the non-creative business elements of music. It's, li- it's right. literally, its only job is to take the creative music and turn it into money. And that's, and you know, if you if you want to have any success, you need to be able to make money out of your music. You know, like success in the classic sense of, you know, of being able to, you know, generate money, which gives you options, 
you know, to go on tour and pay your rent and all that kind of stuff. So like, you know, when someone's like wondering, you know, you know what, what I should do, it's like, you, you need to think like a label. And, and you know, and that's ultimately why people want to sign to a record label because they are going to take care of all that, all that stuff for you. If you're starting out, it's going to be probably more difficult to get signed. And it, it's almost a little bit of a chicken and egg, right? You know, you no one's kind of signing you. And, and I think as well, especially, you know, for me as a label manager, when we would look at artists, I don't think we ever signed somebody off a demo that had never released anywhere before, ever. You had to see some, a bit of a track record, right? As, you know, like, because it's so easy to make good sounding music, right? That what's, and there's so so many artists out there and so much music going on, what's the differentiator is like, well, are people connecting with your music? You know, can you show that, you know, yeah, people are connecting with you. And so you have to get your music out there to kind of show that people like it and, and you know if we're talking about electronic music djs are playing it in clubs and you've, you're getting some kind of traction and and you know another element as well that that does come into play i think more and more these days as it becomes you know th there are more people releasing music is is the artist savvy you know do they get it like do they understand you know you, that it's not just all about you know writing bangers you know it's about um marketing and have you got your branding right and are you connecting with your audience and how are you thinking about how to do that and if you know when you're looking at signing somebody someone who kind of has all that kind of down they're so much more of a valuable asset for you to sign like they're all so much more appealing so you know sort of to go back what you're saying is the way to think about it is it's not a yes or no um, kind of decision on whether you should start a record label or not like if you're gonna if you're starting out definitely set up a record label to release your own music and and you know use the record label model and go through the whole process and do everything a record label would do on your own music to get it out there you know so if you and and to show that people are connecting with your music you're starting to get you know your followers on on um on your social media people are interacting with you you can show you kind of get that side of it you've got you know your spotify your followers are going up all that kind of stuff is all going to really help that when you do send your track off to defected and saying hey i'd really like you to check this out um the last track i put out um you know did really well you know got picked up by these blogs you know i got over you know hit like fifteen thousand streams in the first week you know all that stuff if you're a label you're like oh okay cool i'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to this and you're like oh oh it's actually quite good like yeah and, and you know you're straight away rather than like hey like can you listen to my music I, I think this would be really suited for defected and you know and they do a quick google search and there's kind of like there's nothing out there and they're like eh, it's all right pass you know you're just kind of moving on and and having so you know starting your own label with yourself releasing and, and i guess I'm, I'm really talking to the people who are you know they do want to eventually sign to other record labels um and get their music out there obviously if you want to set yourself up as a record label to sign other people's music and release it i mean yeah you, of course you've got to set up a label properly because there's no other way of kind of doing it but if not if you're that artist you need to self-release your music like a record label and then get signed to other stuff and also you might you know you might have b-sides and stuff and you know you're like you know what this is cool i don't i, I it's maybe i really like this track but you know it's maybe not gonna I'm not really necessarily going to get it signed. You know, I'm going to put it out like, a, you know, as a little cheeky number on my own label, you know, just before Christmas. You've got the machine um, set up for you to be able to deliver that and, and it's all very well organized and you can put it out there and it will do really well. Um, so yeah, and and then, and then you know, you might get really big on, you know, off the back of being signed to a big label and then you're like, you know what, now I'm going to go and really just start releasing my own stuff and signing other people's stuff. And you've got that label already set up there for doing that. And and it just, it, it, it allows you as well to just start thinking like a business. If, and if you're not, if you haven't been doing that, it will provide the structure to be able to do that. Hey, I want to start like selling merch. If you've already started thinking like a business, you understand everything that's got to be going into doing that. You know, okay, I've got to write a little plan. Like, how's it going to work? And hey, cool, I've got my website. So I know I'm going to host my merch on there. Like, you know there's just so many benefits to it in that respect as well that's really cool uh let, there's a question in the chat i have a question uh santi to mcguez i have a question for later how does record labels know a big name artist has supported their music how would a label know that a big name artist has supported their, supported their so you mean well, i mean guess... you mean beyond like you telling them that like hey yes. um yeah 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 <laughs> 
I guess so. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, if they put it in a live, you know, if they put it in a mix or something, I mean, it's pretty obvious to send the mix to somebody to say, here it is. Um, yeah. It, it, I, I, so yeah, beyond that, what I would say is, and so this is, so this is really key if you're releasing electronic music as well. And, and it's a really big part is um, DJ promo, right? So the way I'd approach this as well, if you're starting out and you don't have that many links in the, in your network in your genre of music let's say let's say we're using insanity records and it's a techno label let's say you're young you don't really have that many contacts in the industry you want to go to a dj promo company and you want to get them to pick up the single and you pay them to send it out to all their dj contacts they use they will use a software system there's a couple of different variations out there which I've completely forgotten every single software version out there at the moment. InFlight is in, one of them. In flight, but anyway, it's... It, label machine. Yeah, InFlight. <laughs> label, uh, yeah. label engine. <laughs> yeah. Label engine. Labelworks does it as well. Um, Labelworks does it as yeah, well. Yeah, and, so, and some of the distributors have got the, these systems built into them as well, which makes it like uh, really easy for kind of doing this. But, you know, essentially what happens is um, they will then send it out to their list of contacts and then the DJs will feed back on it. And mm. then they send you a report and they'll say how many times it was downloaded, what the rating was, and the comments. And then, and and that's and that's your kind of you know that's your proof. Hey, here's this point. You can just send that to you know it's a report that you can just send to anybody saying here's you know here's feedback on the track basically. And look, this is everybody that's supporting it, or you know saying they're going to support it and put it in their mixes. And the other really a huge benefit about that as well. Well, a it's going to give you like cool feedback, you know how well the track's doing, but it also allows you to kind of if you do that earlier on before the music before the music release comes out, it kind of can become part of the release story as well. Like, you know, you, when you do a teaser trailer, you know, we did with, this with Siren and, and she had some really big name support it. And it was like, you know, there's there a t music playing and it just had like, oh, I can't remember any other kind of um, artist. It was like Dillinger, love this, you know? And, and she had all these like, you know, big name DJs with their comments. And then mm -hmm. she like had that as text coming over the music and she, you know, she uploaded it and everyone was like, wow, like, it must be like awesome like it must be amazing it was so good for branding and you can you know if you're submitting your music to spotify um playlist like even the, the private ones or you're doing it to the official playlist network i've forgotten the name of it spotify for artists um you include all that information because that's what they want to know like hey is this being supported and you're like yes here is evidence of it being supported so yeah it's very key to do um outside of electronic music as well you can like pr companies will um, do a sim similar thing. I know like, I know heavy metal music does it slightly different. Um, hip hop and like trap is kind of the same thing as electronic. Rock and pop, um, you sort of, yeah, they, they do, they do, a, they tend to kind of push it more onto like radio stations more on, and, and like radio DJs more than the kind of club stuff. But yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big part of, um, of your promo that you should definitely be doing. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> And if you are if you are a techno label and you need and you need help with those PR companies for techno label, I know a load of them and a load of the good ones. So uh, just ask me in the mm. Discord and I'll tell you I'll tell you the ones you need to know. And and you know what? It's another key thing to remember is these aren't services that you just sort of upload and they'll pump your music out to all these contacts. They review it, so it's actually quite a good gate and a good um, barometer of like how good your music is. Because if they're not going to pick it up, back to the drawing board and write better music or sign better music you know like because mm. if they if they if you don't even get past that gate there's no point in moving forward and if you do that's a really good sign and it means you're going to get the music to the djs so um it's it's a very useful tool in that respect as well let's talk we were talking about well, you're talking about spotify there do you want to i know you've got some tips for, for artists to grow their spotify streams because we know that's a that's always a hot topic so um go for it where you really what you really want to be focusing on these days is getting your spotify followers up it's not like streams are great but going back to you know if you're looking to try and get signed to a record label what's the first what's the, where's the first place they're going to go if, they, if they've got half a brain the first place they're going to go is they're going to check out your spotify profile and see how many followers you've got and if you've got a shit ton of followers it's a no-brainer. They're like awesome because they know when the music comes out, there's all those people that's going to appear in their release radar, and their music's going to do really well. And it's also it's you can't, you know, look, we all we all kind of know now with Facebook and Instagram and and even Twitter to some degree, you can kind of like buy likes 
you know, someone can have like 100,000 followers on Instagram. Um, and, you know, and, and when I say buy, I don't, I don't even mean necessarily that you've used some dodgy bot company. You know, you've just, you know, you've done techniques where you've, um, you know, just done um, advertising to countries like Brazil, where it's like 0.001 per link. And, you know, all your followers are there and it's just a vanity number. So because people kind of know that sort of stuff, on Spotify though, you can't do that, right? It's, it's 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 a kind of more rigid system. There's some, you know, there's some sort of like little bot things you can do, but Spotify are getting very good at like closing all that stuff down. So you really like that. That's a key place to really focus on is getting your followers up. If you're starting afresh, what's the best thing you can do? The first thing is to remember that you're not you're not going to be able to on your first release just like instantly be a success. You need to, you need to look at at le- like at least a year's at least a year long of a plan and go. I'm going to put three releases out over the next year and singles. It's like a singles world. If you do want to do EPs and album, of course, but you know, if you, even if you're doing an album, pick three tracks off the album and promote those first as singles um, on Spotify. Another key thing is you can't until you have your first release out on Spotify you can't actually submit to the official Spotify uh, playlists until you've already got a release on Spotify. So your first release is really just to kind of like set everything up. So you got, so I, I would do that first of all, like get your release out, um, do your promo. And then the next part is like, cool, now we're gonna build off the back with our second single. The number one way is, of course you wanna be making sure you're doing, um, like I said, your DJ promo. Um, you wanna make sure that your um, writing a press release and sending that out to like blogs and um, publications to try and get support or go to a PR company that's going to do that for you and pay them. You're, you're roughly, f- for, for numbers, for anyone who's interested, a PR company that are going to push a single and get you some, you know, at more four or five like blog piece, original blog pieces out. You're sort of looking round about the sort of six, seven hundred dollar mark at the moment. Um, with an independent PR company, um, and if you, and I think that's I think it can be really worth it for getting your music out there and showing that it's being supported independently. So you want to make sh- you want to make sure you're doing that. Then uh, then off the back of that, you want to so the the two main ways you're going to get your Spotify um, plays up is getting on playlists, um, and to do that, there's two ways. The first way is to reach out to the is to reach out to the Spotify the private Spotify playlist curators. So those aren't the official Spotify ones, but they're, you know, run by music fans, you know, and they've got like, you know, X amount of like followers on their channel and they curate that music. And there's various ways of going about it. I mean, the first thing you wanna do is go, where is similar music to mine? Where are those playlists, right? And then just literally go and open up a spreadsheet and just copy those playlists in there, right? And then you can usually click on the Spotify playlist info. Sometimes I've got a contact number there. The other thing you can do as well is find like find that list and then put it into Instagram and see if they've got an uh, associated Instagram account. They usually do because um, it's usually run by one person who's a music fan and you know most people have got Instagram accounts so you can find them. So you want to you kind of build out this database and go for like maybe about 20 playlists. And like, and then what you want to do is you want to get on those playlists um, and there's a couple of ways of doing it. First of all, you want to build up a relationship with them somehow. So a good way is by following them on Instagram, then say on your Spotify, uh, say on your Instagram stories or reels saying, hey, um, everyone, you should check out this um, awesome playlist. It's got like all these um, awesome artists on it. And then tag them in that post, right? So they're going to get an alert you saying, oh, hey, there's this artist who's like totally like plugging my playlist. You know, they like they kind of want to see that support, you know, do that a few times, especially if this is a playlist you really kind of want to get on. So then you're kind of going to see alerts are going to see this radar and then you can reach out to them when you've got that track and be like, oh, hey, how's it going? You know, just send them a DM on Instagram or if you have got their email. Hey, yeah, I love your I love your playlist. Um, Yeah, I've been shouting out about it. I've got a track that I think would fit really well with it. Let me know what you think. You know, and that you're going to get a far higher response from just spam, you know, like spamming someone going, hey, check out my track. Like you've already kind of built that relationship up. So that's one way um, of going about it. Second way is using something like Submit Hub. Um, So Submit Hub is like a database of all these playlist suppliers. They also do blogs and stuff. You submit your music, they you, you pay credits. They have to listen to 
30 seconds i think of the music and then um to get to to get paid for it and you can ask them to like feedback on it as well but the key thing is you know they're all just music fans right that you're just trying to get them to listen if they're like oh this is a banger they're going to go, cool, I'm going to put this in my playlist. You know, if you've got great music and it fits with your playlist, they're going to be putting it in there. So that's a, that's another key way uh, of doing it. So that's your kind of your playlist kind of taken care of. And and that should be something you're always kind of doing as well throughout your kind of career is building your relationships up. Because once you get them and you become friends with these people, every time you get a release out, you know, you know, hey, you can send it before it comes out. Got a news track coming out. What do you think? Yeah, love it. Awesome. Let me know when it's live on Spotify and I'll plug it into the playlist. Cool, man. Hope you're well. Have a good summer. Like all that kind of stuff like that that's how things get easier as you progress your career so that's on that playlist side the next part is you then want to run your your facebook and instagram ads that process is going about by first of all i mean there's this uh there's a couple of different strategies so i'll just describe i'll describe one of them that works pretty well i'll get I'll, I'll give an example actually i'll talk through how we did it with siren so this, yeah, you, you basically want to try and ride on the coattails of another audience already where your fans are. So a classic way is doing a bootleg of or a remix of somebody's uh, unofficial remix or a cover of somebody's music. That's a brilliant way of doing it. Um, you can then upload that video into Facebook, run an ad. So, you know, if you're using, you know, let's say you did a cover of... Um, Jamie Jones, grab a, uh, grab a latest Jamie Jones track, you know, turn it, do a bootleg of it, or an unofficial remix of it, and then you can upload that into um, as a video um, into Facebook, and then you can target, so in Facebook you can do an audience, and you can target fans of Jamie Jones, um, mm -hmm. and then you can have, um, and you can just literally run that. You don't even have to necessarily say, click here to download it, but I mean, that would be a benefit as well. Click here to download it. Um, if you like this remix and you can it can go onto your website or onto your MailChimp where they enter their email address and download it or you can use hyped it you know they've got these like download gates so you can start collecting emails right I'd start there um, but even if you don't have the download what you're doing is all those people that are like watching that video and they're like getting into you then when you have your single come out you can retarget those people that listen to like say more than like 15 seconds of that remix because they're most likely going to be something that likes what you're you're doing and then when your release comes out you have your um you have your little teaser trailer of your um music um underneath it you know you have listen now here on spotify they click through and then it goes over to your spotify channel and and it's honestly it's really it's really as simple as that and it, then it's just a numbers game and making sure you're kind of targeting your audience um and putting money in and you don't it's not even you don't have to put thousands in like you know people are doing this with like you know even some big labels i know they're spending like you know less than 150 dollars to kind of get you know like these like thousands of plays um and you know these this momentum on spotify and and making sure you're doing that on the release of like on the release day that you do these ad campaigns because spotify the algorithms kick in so they want to see like a whole lot of people are actually listening to your music I, yeah, I also didn't mention you know making sure you do the pre-save as well which is where people can pre-save that tune on spotify so on release day it also comes out so that's like a that's a really key way and you can literally if you set that up though depending on your budget you can just sort of buy legitimate follows and streams with the more money that you've got so yeah, if you if you happen to be loaded and you want to put ten grand, you could you know on your second and third release on Spotify do incredibly well. I, I, and then, and I'll just go back and quickly as a variation of that strategy. If you don't want to like kind of do the you know the the bootleg or um, the unofficial remix, the other thing you can do is go like what's a audience that might listen to this music, right? So it, you know if a lot of people here are probably into electronic music, we're quite lucky in that respect because a lot of people that listen to electronic music quite like kind of extreme sports stuff, surfing, snowboarding, all that kind of stuff. Like techno and minimal, a lot of like rock climbers, like the whole kind of climbing scene is really into that. What you can do is go and get a rock climbing video, put your music underneath it and then push it. Oh, and then, you know, do a, a, do a video ad on um, Facebook and Instagram where it's that climber and underneath is your music playing. People are going to listen to it and they, and people are going to listen to it. They're, they're not going to like it and they're going to skip past it. They do like it, you know, they're watching it and they're listening to it. You can then on your second Facebook ad, you can just go target people that watched more than 15 seconds of that video. You know, they're invested, you know, they're buying into it. 
Um, it means also that like your advertising costs come down because people are more likely to click through. So it's like a cheaper kind of, you get cheaper click throughs. And again, then there's that funnel and then you say, hey, go and check out my music on Spotify. Because what you're looking for, right, is the guy who likes minimal, if you're like, you know, we're using our techno label, they like techno, they wanna to listen to techno, they're also a rock climber, like that's your ideal audience, isn't it? They're like, hey, cool, I've just found like another uh, like artist that I really like and boom, you've got another fan, another listener um, and you just kind of wanna keep repeating that process. That's really cool. I, that's very, I, I think that's very complicated and I don't know if I lost anybody on it like, cause it is quite a big subject, but I think I've managed to kind of get it a little bit. That was really cool. <laughs> Really, really cool. I, I I like that last bit. I've I've not thought about that before. That's well cool. Yeah, we we did it with Siren, and we did three ads. We did surfing, snowboarding, surfing, snowboarding, and skateboarding. So she's a female mm -hmm. producer as well. You know, it's, it's not as many as especially with guys. So she actually got female snowboarders, surfers, and skateboarders. And yeah, and then we just and we went and like looked up um, all the different snowboarding brands skateboarding brands so we had these three funnels set up um and then we just targeted fans of those brands and we got like yeah we we got like over a million views on the on the videos combined um and then all those went through you know we had them all going down to the actual final track that she put out and it did so well like it was her first release and she got to like number and this is just putting out on her own label she got to number 17 on beatport like it, yeah it works so well and, and i think the total budget was I think it was about four hundred dollars. Like it wasn't even that that big. I think, and that included like DJ promo as well. So she's a drum and bass second, isn't she? Yeah, drum and bass producer. What I'll say as well, guys, I'm just gonna before I finish on this like kind of advertising rant, is that right now we are in a golden time where by just doing exactly what I said, you can go out and find fans of the music you make like that's pretty fucking cool like you can just set it up put money in and find these fans like the, and it's that in 10 years people are gonna look back and go oh my god it was so easy like you know Facebook, <laughs> there was all the privatization things weren't in there like we've already started seeing with ios 14 changing it's going to get harder and harder and harder and harder and harder like you know if you want to set yourself up for in 10 years you can just build your fan base now like it is I mean, it was a golden age, like, you know, three or four years ago. It's slowly tightening, but the window is still there for the next, you know, couple of years. But it is going to get harder and harder and harder. So, you know, if you're not already doing this, you need to jump on it now. One thing I, one thing we uh, you can we can add to that, your playlist comments is uh, join our Discord because we look at music on a Friday and we put it in our playlist on Data Transmission. There we go. Literally on a Friday morning, you drop your tracks in the Discord in the New Music Friday playlist section, and we check them out and stick them in our playlist. It's simple as. And then I play them on a Friday afternoon on my uh, New Music Friday stream. Uh, and if you're looking for blogs, hi, oh, I have my blog. You didn't know. Data transmissions, very well respected. I'm, I'm, I'm actually a little bit honoured. I'm on here with you, Graham, because. <laughs> I think I used to. I mean, I think I've submitted stuff to Data Transmissions back in Never Say Die days. I yeah, think like, it's, did. I, yeah, it's 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 a great blog, man. You've done really well with that, and just continuing to evolve. It's really cool to see, man. Shelley does all our drum and bass stuff now, so she's uh she takes all, takes over all the drum. And she's actually covered Siren, actually. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Already. Yeah, I'm sure she's yeah I'm sure yeah. She's, made, she's, she's good she's supporter. Made, Wicked, right? Uh, where are we up to on our, on our list of things we haven't talked about? Has anyone got any questions in the chat for Nick? While while I just quickly scan. Which platforms would you prioritize targeted ads? Yeah, I think what I think there's like you know because you can be on Instagram Reels, you can be on um, the Facebook feed, Instagram feed, Instagram Stories, and yeah, there, there's yeah there's the, the the Facebook network. It always switches. There's always a bit of a like. It seems to change like from what i can tell if you've set up a new business a, a new business account uh, sorry a new facebook uh business ad account which is what you have to do to kind of do this kind of like targeting like you know you're not boosting ads so you're not boosting posts you're kind of doing it properly if, you, if you've got a new account and you haven't really run any ads the best bet is to just go for um like facebook feed instagram feed instagram stories and then just kind of turn off everything else because they've got like extended network and, and all this kind of stuff. Like turn all those off and you kind of get your best bang for your buck. However, now the algorithms are getting really good 
um, the Facebook algorithms kind of find your audience because it does all this like testing and stuff like that behind the scenes when you run an ad. What it seems is once you've been running ads and you've done, you know, like more than 10 campaigns over time, it actually seems to be better to just let Facebook to do, put it wherever it wants. So if you're, you're actually getting better bang for your buck on Facebook feed, it'll put most of your ads on there. If you are getting it on one of its, you know, third party networks, it'll put it there. It actually, it's in their benefit for it to work out well for you because then you're going to make more money and you're going to keep investing and in doing this kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of like my advice is if you're starting out, just narrow it down to the kind of the, the, the feeds and the reels. Um, and then as you, as you progress, expand, just let, just let Facebook do its thing basically. What are your thoughts on, I know, I know a lot of producers moan about, uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, Spotify's small payouts. What, what are your thoughts on that for like, I guess, small artists, because a lot of, I see a lot of small artists saying, well, we don't get paid enough out of Spotify anymore. What's the point? So the way I look at it is Spotify is a advertising as a way to advertise your music uh it's a, it's like it's like youtube um or soundcloud but you know if you get a track that pops you'll actually make some money um and if you look at spotify that way then you sort of just you know it, you, then the, the small amount of payouts that you get it it, it doesn't really matter because you're like you know and you've got to be on there right you know it's, it's we have it's so many people such a huge portion of the of the world listen to music on there you sort of just you've got to be on there and like i was mentioning earlier you know if you want to get signed to a bigger label it's where people are going to look at and uh you know are you doing well on there so if you change your mindset from like oh you know spotify if i'm not making money on spotify if it's not doing well for me what's the point to spotify is just an advertising tool for me that i might make some money off the back of it in the long run it's an easier it's an easier way of kind of looking at it and, that, and that's what i always say to any artists i work with you know, it's just a, yeah, it's a advertising platform for you to, to promote your music um, and where you make your money, you know, if you get your audiences on there and, and that's why Spotify, have, you know, they're sort of aware of that a little bit as well. You know, you can have your, um, you can have your merch link in there. You know, when you have, if you do release a CD and you sell it on your website where you're going to actually have some pretty good margins on and make some money or, you know, some t-shirts and stuff, people that like it, they can go to your, um, your profile page and click on it. And then that's where you kind of make your money. Or, you know, you use it to try and, you know, get emails and, and they become super fans and stuff. So I, I always look at it, I always say Spotify is like a kind of top of funnel, a top of funnel platform. Um, and if you look at it that way, yeah, it's it's a kind of, it fits into the bigger picture a lot easier. That's great, because that's exactly how I think about it as well. <laughs> it's about, I, th I always think it's like, it's great for discoverability. Like That's it. That's the word I said, yeah. People can find you on there quicker because you can gain millions of playlists, which is which makes you more discoverable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you're right. It's uh, the discovery. It's a discovery platform. That's actually a better way of putting it. It's it's think of it like a discovery platform, not an advertising platform. Discovery platform. Let's chat through promo tips for artists or have upcoming releases. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mean the advertising stuff's pretty key. I, I actually one thing you should always do is don't wait to the last minute until you decide to do your promo you know if you're just letting people know about your music the day it's out it can be really difficult to promote it unless you know and, and i'm i'm addressing here independent artists um or you know artists that are kind of maybe at the beginning of their career this is where the, most of my you know what i'm speaking who i'm speaking to are, are those kind of people you know if you're if you're already quite famous a lot of the stuff it, you know it doesn't really matter you know if you're famous you can just drop a track no one knows about it and you can just drop a track and say hey i've got this new track out with a music video and it'll explode right mm -hmm. that that's kind of not who i'm talking to um if you want to uh, you know if you're an independent artist you need to be building your story up before your release day for, um, for so many reasons like um from a press angle right i mean you know about this you know if some mm -hmm. if you just hear about a track um if you want to get a premiere on a channel you got to sort that out beforehand, not after. Once it's out, it's not fresh, right? Like, you know, yep. the people want to be, like the DJs want to get the music early. The publications want to get the music early. You know, if you want to be reviewed in a magazine as well, you have to get the music to them two months before. So they've got time to review it, to, you know, get it in so it can be um, published. So like on a PR point, you definitely have to um, do it earlier. It also allows you to build seven touch points so there's a there's a kind of theory in marketing where 
people have to see something seven times before they will trust and interact with it. So every time you're putting out, uh, you know, like, so for instance, the first thing I would, you know, I, I would often put out when I'm doing a release is a is the artwork with when the release date is of that single that's coming out, you know, let's like five weeks down the line. That's your first touch point, right? Oh, hey, you know, to your followers and stuff and you put it on social media. If you've got an email list, you go, hey, my new release is coming out on the uh, 1st of October, um, here's the artwork, you know, that's that first touch point. And then all the way through, while you're leading up to the release date, there are just so many opportunities to have all those touch points and to create assets around those touch points. So yeah, so a big part of promo is, is creating ma uh, marketing assets that you can put out there for people to know that this music's coming. Um, and, and because then, when you actually come to release day and you're like, hey, it's finally out, you can listen to it here, um, you know, get, download it on Beatport, right? If you've been, you know, if you've been seeing like this single that's coming and it keeps popping up in your streams and stuff and all that kind of stuff, and then someone goes, hey, it's out now, what are your chances of clicking on and going and checking it out compared to the other person who's just, you've never seen, heard about them before, and then they're like, hey, my single's out, go check it out. You're not, right? You're going to go click on the one that you've been following the story and seeing what's going along and learning about that person. And so, some, so you know, going back to what are some of those touch points and creating those assets. Uh, so for producers, a really easy one that I think works really well um, is just do a track breakdown. Fire, you go to loom.com, um, which is like a free um, recording software, and then just open up your digital audio workstation, um, open up the finished track, and then just, you know, play a bit of the track and just talk through like what are your plugins that you use what synths do you use what kind of like you know very on a, i mean you know you know what producers like you could probably have a half an hour kind of clip move uh, clip right there you up to load to youtube but you know try and keep it kind of short and punchy edit it down to a few minutes bang that's a great asset you know people are going to find out a little bit about more about the music and kind of what you do um, and very simple to do. That's another asset. So, you, you know, you've got two assets now. You can do a get to know, which is where you can essentially create your own interview where you just have some key questions um, and it just pops up on the screen, you know, like um, first rave experience. And, you know, you just kind of talk to camera and say it was this, that and the other. Um, just put that into a video. Um, and then again, that's another asset you can upload across um, your social media um, and people can kind of find out about you or you might want to kind of talk about the music um, that's a great one yeah and and people just think you know well it's awesome like you just create your interview also if you're a duo there's a, there's a few duos if you're a duo you interview each other yeah exactly that's, that's a, another great way of doing it I mean on release day as well there's, there's you know now with um, streaming and people you know being used to yeah, logging on to like a Zoom session or a streaming session, or, you know, like what we're doing right now, you know, a Twitch session, you know, have a um, release party on the actual day of the release as well. Um, cool. You know, where you kind of, you know, talk about what you're doing, get all the people that are like been following you, get you, you know, just get get your friends and family like involved. Everyone's, you know, it's not hard to get sort of 15 people on something and, you know, you can kind of like play the track, talk about it, say, hey, um, if you're a DJ as well, another really key thing would be, you know, do a little DJ set of, you know, where you play the track to start off with and, and do a mix. If you're releasing your music on a Friday, it works out really well because you can do a stream on a Friday night. Everybody's kind of at home. Um, well, they might be going out now, kind of COVID's a bit locked down. But if you're at home, have a drink, listen to some music and, you know, kind of celebrate your music coming out. Um, leading up to the release as well, you can do like a countdown. Um, so if your release is on the Friday, you know, just the artwork with like the number over it, three, two, one, and just upload that on like the, you know, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then out now. Um, Do you know, I was just thinking, sorry, I, I keep cutting you off. That's really annoying on myself, but sorry. Uh, what I was thinking when you were saying about streams is and lockdown is, do you stream first thing in the morning on a Friday morning? Because all of Australia's all locked down and they'll they'll all hear it then. And you've got, you've got a guaranteed audience then. I guess if you got your, if you know you've got an audience in Australia, definitely. I mean, or just, you know, if, if, the, if it's a big release for you, you know, all day Fridays, you know, pumping it out, get yeah. up in the morning and do, you know, one stream in the morning for half an hour for the Aussie guys in, in New Zealand. <laughs> and then, you know, do another one at like six o'clock for UK, six, seven o'clock for UK and um, Europe. And then, you know, keep partying 
and then switch back on at 2 a.m. for, you know, all our New York and, or sorry, all the people over in L.A. Um, for them yeah. to tune in <laughs> and then collapse. <laughs> and then, yes. <laughs> yeah, but that gives you another asset. I'm doing a whole day street. I'm doing a whole, I'm doing a day of parties to celebrate my release. Exactly. Like, you know, there's just, just so many... Uh, I mean, if you're if you're a band or something as well, do a, you know talk about um, you know what in, what instruments and guitar pedals and stuff um, do you use to make your music? You know, just so simple. Like, just get your camera up, switch it on, you know, selfie, and be like, yeah, you know, this, uh, this is my favorite um, uh, synth, and you know, I, I bought this back in, you know, blah 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 blah, and I like it because of you know it does these cool bass lines, and you know, and this is my favorite pedal, like. You know, there's just there's so many opportunities to create stuff where people get to know more about you and connect with you, um, and you know, and ha have that relationship where they're going to be invested. That when your music comes out, they're going to go and you know, they're going to be like, "What does this actually sound like?" Fucking seeing this guy and 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 all this kind of stuff. Is this you know, is it going to live up to the hype? You know, and you're gonna you're gonna go check it out even if for just that one reason. Uh, but of course, you know, you go on Spotify and listen to it. Spotify is like, oh, good, another listener. You know, hey, this one's doing well. Like, you know, we're going to, the algorithm picks up on it. Like all these kind of things, all these little things come together. And, and that's how you get the, you know, success that you're looking for. Before you dip, let's just show us the book again and talk about the book. The final, final, final. Because obviously we kind of mentioned you'd spent nine min months writing the first version. How, when did that kind of evolve into this wonderful now book? I think the first version was like about 40,000 words and then it ended up being about 82,000 words so it like pretty much doubled in size you know I guess I just was like if you're going to write a I think it was Tim Ferriss who said it on his on his um his podcast if you're going to write a book write a book like like don't fuck around like you know just do it properly <laughs> you know and because and I think when I was doing my when I first did my draft I was like oh, yeah, I should kind of talk about that and I was like oh, it's kind of boring you know like but then at the you know to when i was you know when i met colin and actually was like okay this is now a reality um and i went back and was like okay now you know i'm gonna make this comprehensive and really go in on it and make sure that i'm covering kind of every sort of element that there is yeah there was there was a lot more writing to do a big and a, a really important part for me as well so so the book is divided up into four main sections so the first section is um, like music industry so there's like a little um there's a uh a little diagram that i put together that sort of you can basically see is like all the different i loved it i think i'm doing that right yeah yeah like, all yeah, the yeah, different yeah. elements and how that and how all the different parts in music industry works together and then you know it just it talks about what those parts are why they're important how they're related to all the other bits you know so it's kind of like background then the the second part is um, on music copyright um, and that was actually the hardest part to write because if anyone here is listening um, that are, I mean and Graham you know this like music copyrights is just such a complicated beast to understand <laughs> you've got the music you've got the music masters you've got the the publishing side you know it, like even like understanding that those are two very different copyrights and the way they work can be really hard for artists to get their head around um, and then off the back of that, there's like all the different copyrights that fall off. And I really wanted to be able to create something that would break it down really easily for anybody to completely understand how it all works out and then how they can make sure their copyrights are covered and how they can um, make sure they're registered and actually collect all the royalties. And I, I think I've nailed it. Like I've managed to to kind of make it comprehensive and understanding to, to the layman. I've got like a basically a massive diagram that kind of shows how everything is connected and then it breaks it down and and another really important element for that as well is so there's there's books out there that talk about this um donald passman's everything you need to about the music business does this as well but the biggest problem i found out what i found when i was you know when I, I we started the record labels and i was you know learning about all this stuff is that it's usually written by somebody who as uh, or maybe got a bit of a legal experience but it's either they're written for the american market or it's written for the uk market um and the way that the copyrights work are different in each of those territories mm. 
So I'd be like reading about the US and I was like, but then how does that work with like PRS in the UK? And it'd be really confusing. And so what I've done is I've approached it from like, like international basically, because nowadays when you release music, right, you've, you release music internationally, right? You're, you're not just releasing CDs in America and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's, uh, most independent record labels, that's what they do. So it's uh, the way I've approached it is like, this is how it works. And you know, well, this is how the whole thing works. And this is the difference with the UK and Europe. And this is the difference with the US and how they're kind of related to each other. Um, and yeah, it was really important for me to kind of put that in there as well. And I, and I think I've kind of managed to do that. So that's the kind of second section. And then the third that's section- sick. Yeah, the th- the third section is um, is the for the practical elements. So kind of why we talked about. So you know the seven steps. It's it's obviously elaborates a little bit more on that. So it's your foundation setting up. The the second part is going through everything you need to do a, a music release, and then the um, third part is. Um, how you do all your promos so kind of what I talked through as well with those different strategies that's all in there you know plus a few um, other different ones that you can do and then the fourth part of the book is you know how you grow and how you expand so um, setting up merchandise you know if you're going to do live uh, uh, live record label shows uh, sorry label nights that's what it's called label nights how you do music compilations um, royalties you know how you actually do all your accounting and royalty properly um, and yeah, so that's kind of like how the, the kind of the books set out. Um, so if you do, if you're kind of experienced in the music industry already and you're just interested in the label, you can actually just jump to the third section and kind of just follow that all the way through. But if you know, if you're, if you're new to it all as well and you just want to have a, a, a good understanding or an excellent understanding, um, just start at the beginning and read all the way through. Do you know, I, I, I did a video with PRS and uh, PPL on, um, on literature on how it all works. And I put it up and within a, I got the first comment was, "Wow, this bo- this video is boring," <laughs> and I was like, and I, <laughs> and, I, and, I, "And I was like, yes, yes, that subject is really boring, but so useful. Like, just just sit through uh, it, please." Yeah, it, it it is. It's such a. It is the most boring part, but if you can understand it, it's it's so valuable. I mean, you, a you're not ever going to get ripped off. A mm. it's going to be able to if you do get sent a record contract, you know whether or not it's in your favor or not. You know, and it's also going to make you know you're going to be you're going to understand the, how you get your publishing, how you make sure you get everything registered, and you know it's all the little it's all the little bits, it's all those little um, it's all those little um, revenue streams that all add up that allows you to kind of like have a career where you're earning some decent money with your music. Is there going to be an audio book? Yes, uh, not uh, so. It won't be out until twelve months after the release of the first book, so it's like. It's 12 months of this. And then, so I imagine it'll come out June, July next year. Yeah, so that, so there will be an audio book as the, as the kind of bigger picture. Um, Ske- Skeleton Keys wants to know Nick's craziest music industry story. And he's actually even like, he's actually used some of his, some of his channel points to make it so it's highlighted. So he really wants to know. I'm trying to think what's the craziest. Um, I mean, tours are always the craziest. The, the difficulty with this question is you don't want to Liability. Kind of, <laughs> exactly. It's like, you know, if we're having a private conversation, like I could really like, you know, tell you about like crazy stuff. Actually, you know what? I, I, actually, there's a, there's a funny story that I did. Um, so I was at Tomorrow World in, I think it was Tomorrow World in Miami and we were backstage we're in the backstage tents and i you know just mingling around like having drinks and stuff it was the sort of afternoon and um i uh, which i was just in a random group kind of and i got introduced and i was like hey how's it going and stuff and um at the time i'd been reading a book on uh memory like different types of like memory techniques to remember stuff and you know because i know that like networking remembering people's names is super super key the americans are so good at this shit like you know they'll remember your first name last name like what football team you support you know your what your your birthday your wife's birthday how many kids but it's like that that level creates really strong connections when you're out and about you know but it all starts with at least remembering someone's name right if you turn up somewhere and someone's like remembers you and says your name you're like wow i've got respect for that person so i'm like i really want to kind of you know remember names and so i was reading this book about it got introduced and uh i got introduced a guy called tice 
um, and you know we're sort of mingling. And because I'm reading this book, I decide to um, I decide to say, I, and in my head, I was like, how can I remember this guy's Tyson? I was like, Tyson, and uh, sorry, and, the, and the, the idea with trying to remember people's names is you have to like try and imagine something really weird and obscure. And even if it's like a bit disgusting and stuff, the more kind of out there, the more vivid it is in your mind and the easier it is to remember. So I imagined that there was Mike Tyson sitting on his head who had these massive balls who were just like falling on his face. And I, <laughs> thought, oh, and, and I was like, and I was, oh, I mean, I've never forgotten the guy's name, right? It totally works. Um, and then I was talking. And so we started up this, having this conversation and, um, and and he said oh well how are you remembering my name and i was like oh well you know and i had a few drinks so i thought i'd just tell him what the hell so i tell him and it just is like dead like no laughter or anything and um and walter um who i who i knew came over and then he was sort of rescued me for the conversation and i was and he was like oh do you, do you know who that was and i was like oh no no and he's like that's tice from noisier like and I was like oh shit and he's like yeah he doesn't like he's not down with those kind of like uh, but like jokes and things like that and I was like ah oh, okay and so just totally got off on the wrong foot with uh <laughs> with noisier after that I I've, I think after the years he eventually kind of came around um but yeah I don't know if that's like really a, a crazy story but it's a, a safe story of of something stupid I guess I did uh in that's the industry cool. I, I I terrible at remembering names I always use I always use the uh introduce them to somebody else I'm like hey have you met so-and-so and they go oh i'm so-and-so and you're like oh that's so-and-so and you're like yeah I always, that's that's how i get around it yeah the, the repeating name thing um yeah 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 that's always good yeah or whisper in someone or go i've completely forgotten your name um can you just all right how does it and how do you say you go oh that's right you go to you whisper in someone's ear that doesn't know them that you know and say introduce yourself um, in front of me so they have to say their name and then they come up and you know they're like oh hey I'm Rick and then they have to say oh hey and I'm like and then you do they're like oh yeah hey sorry I forgot to introduce you John this is Rick <laughs> and then you're like kind of saved from forgetting their name or from not yeah, remembering nice. their name uh, one thing we, you said you are running a special one dollar trial access to the whole platform uh, we've been putting the link in the chat I think Grindy Mar will do it yes. one more time huh? Uh, and then we've been putting the link to the book in the chat as well. Go and grab Nick's book, everyone. Go and grab it now. Yeah, grab the book. Yeah, if you're if you're based in the UK as well, get it off the the publisher's website. Um, it supports the publisher and me kind of a lot more than going through Amazon and Jeff getting his massive cut. We're here. Um, thank you so much for joining me. It's been so much fun. Yeah, thank you, Graham. Yeah, it was totally awesome. What was your biggest takeaway from that video? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to know what you're getting out of these videos. Uh, I'll be reading all the comments and replying to them. If you've got any questions about the video or you've got any thoughts about the video, let me know in the comments below uh, and I'll be jumping in those comments afterwards. Let me know, I'd love to see you in the comments. Also consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. It's free and you can always unsubscribe anyway. I'd love to grow this channel and this community on YouTube. So please consider subscribing. It means you get the videos first and you get notified when the videos go live. If you want to watch these interviews live, come and join us on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Graham Farmer. The link is in the description. Come and join us live on Twitch, subscribe over there, and join us live in the chat and be part of the, the OGs in the crew. Finally, if you want to join our big networking server for producers, DJs, artists, come and join us on Discord. It's really cool. It's really fun hanging out in Discord. Again, the link's below. Join us in the Discord. Um, and you get all the access to all the A&R feedback sessions and all the forms to, to submit your tracks to labels first. They're always in there first. I'll be answering questions in there again as well. Join us in there. It's good fun. Thanks again for joining us on YouTube. And I will see you in the next video or live stream. I'll see you soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.